topic here is an update on Maris OAI Academic Early Alert System. Um, and whether you're joining us in the morning or afternoon or, or evening, we, we certainly appreciate your interest and in, in taking the time out today to, to join us. My name is Kate Valenti. I'm the Senior Director of Integration Services at Unicon. And uh, over the past few months, I've had the, the pleasure of working with uh, Josh and Sandeep uh, at Marist to uh, help move this project along. Uh, so uh, Josh and Sandeep and, and Bob listed on the slide here are really going to do the heavy lifting on the webinar today, but I'll give you a, a few housekeeping notes and then a little bit of an intro of, of what our plan is for the webinar. Uh, so just some housekeeping. We will be recording the session. We'll make sure that folks get that after the fact. So if you have other colleagues who are interested in, uh, in watching, we can, uh, you can distribute that. And uh, right now, everybody is muted. Um, participants are muted just to, to keep the sound down. Uh, we will unmute folks at the end. Um, if you're dialed in via the, the Adobe uh, audio and you have questions at the end, please feel free to use the chat screen. And uh, I'll be monitoring that. Um, so what we're going to walk through today, Josh is going to walk us through an overview of OAAI to, to give some foundational information just to, for folks who may not be as familiar or need a refresher, uh, as well as the findings that came out of that research. And then he'll share a little bit around some strategic vision for the open learning analytics space before handing it over to Sandeep and Bob, who are going to discuss the open source technology that we've really recently collaborated on. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap up with some opportunities to connect opportunities that are coming up uh, pretty soon to, to get together and to further this conversation. And we will absolutely leave time at the end for questions. So we have a very varied audience. We're going to try to hit things at a high level. And if there are things that you want to dive into more deeply, please feel free to, to jump in at the end and ask your questions. All right. So um, without uh, further ado, I will hand it over to Josh. Uh, Bob, if you want to advance the slide. Great. Thanks a lot, Kate, and thanks to you and every UNCOM for helping get this uh, webinar organized. As, as Kate's mentioned, I'm going to be doing this pretty quick and just give everybody this high-level overview of the Open Academic Analytics Initiative, or OAI, uh, in large part because it's going to set the context for what Sandeep and Bob will be showing, uh, which is really work that's now been happening since that initiative ended and really kind of building on top of the success of that, that project. So uh, a little quick uh, intro on OAI. This was a program that was supported through the EDUCAUSE Next Generation Learning Challenges uh, program that was funded primarily by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We had about a quarter of a million dollars over what really became almost two years. Um, and the goal was really around developing and deploying a open source academic early alert system that would allow us to predict which students were at risk uh, to not complete courses and, and do that on a very kind of specific course level. We also had the goal of doing these predictions very early in the semester, so the first two to three weeks. Uh, once students were identified at being at risk to not complete their courses, we then uh, deployed interventions that were designed to help turn things around in a sense and, and hopefully get them to be successful in completing their course um, and mastering the content of that course. In addition to developing this kind of early prototype system and deploying it, we also were funded to engage in research around what we call critical scaling factors in learning analytics issues. and. Uh, you know, topics that impact on how much or how easily we can scale this kind of technology across all, higher, all, all of higher ed. And there we kind of focused on two major research agendas. One was around this question of portability of predictive models. So we were really interested in understanding if we build a predictive model from data from one type of student population, let's say students here at Marist, which is we're a four-year private liberal arts college, how well will that model perform, let's say, in its accuracy of making predictions if we deploy it at a very different type of institution, let's say, a two-year community college? So that was one area of research. The other was around the intervention strategies. So we were looking at how effective uh, several different strategies were, trying to understand you know, what was the most effective way of intervening with students. So if we go on to the next slide, I'll drill into this just a little bit more so you have a better sense of how the system was developed and works. Um, and so the first thing we did was to uh, create a predictive model based on historic data, historical data, excuse me. 
And here we are working with two primary data sets. One was uh, student demographic and aptitude data. So this is things like SAT scores, ACT scores, uh, high school ranking, cumulative GPA, college, age, so forth. Most of that data was coming out of the student information systems. And we were also working with uh, LMS data, in this case Sakai, and we were looking at and using uh, event log data, so looking at everything students are clicking on, content they're reading, assignments they're submitting, and so forth. And we also used data from uh, the grade book. Um, so we, we took uh, uh, data from several semesters, uh, brought that into a suite, an open source suite of BI tools that allowed us to mine that data, looking for patterns. Once we'd identify those patterns that linked those data sets to student success in courses, we were able to create predictive models uh, and ultimately arrived at a predictive model we thought was the most powerful. I'm cutting out about six months of heavy work that consumed Sandeep's life, so I apologize, Sandeep, but uh, we'll share more details or at least where to get more details uh, here in a minute. Once that model was developed, we then uh, deployed this system at uh, two community colleges, two historically black college universities. And so in almost kind of uh, real time as the semester was rolling, rolling off, we uh, fed data from uh, the courses, Sakai data, for example, into the predictive model, used the scoring process uh, to then identify which students were at risk to not complete their courses. And ultimately, that produced what we called an academic alert report, which listed and identified those students. Uh, that was sent to the instructor, who then uh, was in charge of deploying uh, one of two different intervention strategies, either what we called an awareness intervention, a very simple message going to the student to alert them that there is a concern and recommending things that they might do to, to improve, like going to see a tutor. And the other intervention strategy was around uh, having students join an online academic support group or environment um, with a similar kind of, of message. Uh, so when we go on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about our research design. So I, I mentioned already that we deployed at community colleges and HBCUs. Uh, in total, we had about 2,200 students across two semesters that were involved in these pilots. And uh, I think we had a fairly rigorous research design methodology where in most cases we had a, uh, one instructor who was teaching uh, the same course, uh, sorry, one instructor was teaching three sections of the same course. Uh, one section acted as a control group, so they didn't receive any interventions. And then uh, we had uh, the two other sections received one of the, one of the two interventions I've already uh, mentioned. So that really allowed us to really look at, uh, in a rigorous way, how effective our interventions were in terms of uh, improving student success in courses. Uh, we ran our predictions at three intervals during the semester, about 25% in, 50% in, and 75% in. The 25% mark in a 15, 16-week course was around that two to three week benchmark that we were shooting for in terms of making predictions that early in, in the course. Obviously, uh, that's a key issue. If we can make predictions very early, we have a much better chance of intervening and improving student uh, success. So I'll now kind of share some of the, uh, the findings. I'm not going to have time to highlight them all, uh, but again, in a minute, I'll point you to where you can get a lot more details on the work we did under OAI. So these are the portability findings from the, uh, the spring deployment of 2012. Um, and what you'll see there highlighted is uh, one of several measures we are looking at, which is at least to me, the simplest one to understand, which is around the accuracy of the predictions being made. Um, when we started this project, we actually thought, our researchers here thought, that we would be in the 30 to 40 percent accuracy range. So the idea was that the models wouldn't perform very well once we moved them from one context like Marist to a different context like a community college. But as you can see, the accuracies were in the 65 to 75 or all the way up almost to 80 percent range. Uh, depending on the point in the semester. So that was a, a, a pleasant surprise, in a sense, in terms of findings. Now, obviously, uh, maybe you can go to the next slide. You can see that, that the, the same findings were repeated, basically, uh, in the fall semester. So we have some confidence that it wasn't just a fluke in the spring, but, but the models do actually seem to perform pretty well out of the box. Now, obviously, we would much prefer 85, 90, 95 percent accuracy of these models. And so what we've now more recently been doing is something we call tuning. 
So we'll take the generic model that we've produced uh, with Barris data and then use data from a specific student population, program, or institution to then tune that model to increase the performance. And, and that's something we think we can use to, to increase the, the accuracy of these models uh, on a kind of institution by institution basis. But it's much easier and faster than, let's say, developing a model uh, from scratch. So if we go on now, we'll see some of the findings from our intervention strategies. Uh, so in terms of impact on final course grades, uh, we had a statistically significant outcome, which I think is significant in itself, meaning that we have some real evidence that these interventions really did have a positive effect on student final course grades. Um, now, one of the things you'll also notice here is that we did not find a difference between the two different types of interventions. So both the awareness and the online academic support environment and interventions seem to have, uh, interestingly enough, almost exactly the same effect. Um, and our theory here, at least, is that it was really the simple act of making the students, A, aware that there was a problem and concern early in the semester, and making them feel supported and that there was somebody there who was looking out for them and offering help. Uh, there's other research that, that backs that up in terms of that being an effective strategy in, in helping students improve in their academic um, uh, performance. So again, uh, we weren't necessarily expecting statistically significant findings, but um, we're really excited that, that we had enough of a sample that we were able to demonstrate that. And those trends, uh, we also looked at low-income students uh, that we defined in terms of Pell Grant eligibility, and we saw similar trends with low-income students, which is a particular area of interest for the Gates Foundation. If we go to the next slide, we'll see another uh, kind of criteria that we looked at, which was content mastery. This is a, a, a common benchmark that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation looks at. They define this as a grade of a C or better. And here, too, we found statistically significant evidence that students who were uh, received interventions were more likely to master content than those students in our control groups who were not receiving interventions. Um, which was also a very positive finding in our, in our mind. In, in large records, we still feel that this was pretty early work, and, and the fact that we had encouraging results of this nature early on gives us some confidence that over time we can even uh, vastly improve upon this positive outcome. Um, I think the last slide here may be about um, to some faculty feedback. So this is obviously anecdotal. But uh, we, we did get a lot of positive feedback from faculty and students. Um, I think uh, particularly with faculty members at community colleges, they tend to have huge numbers of students. They have a lot going on. And the ability to get this list that allowed them to really focus their limited time and resources on students that were in most need of help seemed to be something they saw a tremendous uh, value in. Um, so I've done this very high-level overview, uh, skipping over a lot of really sophisticated analytics work that took place. Uh, Sandeep and some of our faculty members here at Marist spent uh, a lot of time uh, using sophisticated algorithms and analytical data mining processes to do a lot of this work. So I don't want to uh, diminish that, but uh, don't have a lot of time to go over that, or some of the other findings. Uh, some of which were, uh, you know, I think quite intriguing to us. So if you're interested in getting more details, obviously we can take questions at the end, but we did have a large 40-page uh, research paper published in the Peer Review uh, Review Journal for Learning Analytics uh, recently, and we'll be making these slides available to everybody following the webinar, but certainly that's a place to go if you want to dig in to a lot of the details. So I'm going to wrap up here by uh, talking about some of the kind of next steps and the kind of strategic vision that we have here at Marist for where we want to be going uh, now, building on the success of the OAI project. I certainly want to make sure people realize that these ideas are not mine alone or Marist. There's a, a lot of uh, people thinking about this in the Imperial Learning Analytics community. Um, but I think we, we have a lot of uh, strategic buy-in here at Marist to working towards this strategic vision of basically building out an open learning analytics platform. I think many of you probably on the phone have seen 
that there's been a lot of silos built out in the last few years of analytics tools within existing systems. So we have a lot of analytics tools, for example, getting built out in the LMSs, uh, in ERP systems, and so forth. There's very few, and I don't know of any open source, platforms that are really dedicated specifically to facilitating learning analytics, and, and not just early alert systems, but a broad spectrum of analytic uh, kind of capabilities. So what we're looking at is having kind of a system that has these five major components, uh, a collections component. Uh, obviously, we need to leverage things like APIs to be able to pull data from many different sources. If we limit ourselves to just the sources I've mentioned, for example, I don't think we'll tap into the full power of learning analytics. We need a central repository or a storage component where we can put all this data and then mine that data and so forth. A learning uh, analysis, data analysis component where the kind of uh, heavy lifting of the, the analysis, the data mining, the processing takes place. Um, and then a minute alternative to Sandeep who's going to talk about the work that's already happened in that, that component. Uh, the output from the analysis needs to go someplace, and so we're envisioning both a set of communication components, things like dashboards that would be uh, easily implemented in a range of different systems, and uh, finally um, uh, uh, an action kind of component because there's lots of other systems that would like to receive output from learning analytics uh, to then take advantage of that. And as one quick example, the student success plan, open source project you may be aware of, kind of a case audit management tool for uh, advisors and students. Uh, we're working with them to look at bringing alerts from our system in there to trigger follow-up with students, just as one example. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sandeep and, and Bob as well to talk about some of the work that uh, we've been doing in the learning data analysis kind of component, and they will then also demo some of that work um, so you can see what it looks like. So Sandeep? Yep. Thanks, Josh. Uh, uh, in this particular uh, webinar, we'll be concentrating more towards the analysis piece, uh, the LOPs which you see in the strategic vision. Uh, basically, uh, you can uh, uh, think of it as like the brains of the operation where, you know, there are a lot of data mining models, a lot of predictive uh, analytics that is going on. Uh, you know, a lot of applications related to other kind of uh, analytics as well, like social media analytics text analytics, et cetera. So uh, what you uh, can envision this piece to be is more like an app store, having like multiple applications where uh, the targeted application is pulling data from uh, various repositories uh, and uh, running some analysis pieces on that and uh, projecting the results to the various other parts like the action and the communication pieces. So with that in mind, uh, when uh, we were automating the OEAI work, we wanted to come up with an architecture uh, that can be used as a reference for the other kind of applications that can be uh, envisioned in this particular piece, uh, where they can use a similar kind of uh, architecture uh, or at least consider uh, uh, the ways that we are using in terms of uh, uh, realizing this App Store model. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we speak a little bit about the technology stack uh, that we use in coming up with uh, something called a learning analytics processor. Uh, th this particular processor, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it, is, it is envisioned to have like multiple pipelines where each pipeline can be a separate application. OEAI, which has the early alert system, uh, it can have like a separate pipeline and that would be an application within this particular uh, processor. So uh, in terms of technical stack, what we have is a Java-based uh, uh, web application uh, where we are using Maven for our builds. Uh, there is a temporary storage piece. Uh, for that, we are using H2 in-memory database. Uh, we wanted to make the system performant wherever possible uh, and uh, using in-memory databases for some of our analysis pieces uh, will definitely resolve those kind, uh, will address those kind of challenges. Uh, then we have the persistent storage, which is the MySQL. Uh, we want to keep this uh, framework completely open source, hence the uh, choice of that particular technology. Uh, then uh, we are also uh, um, releasing the models, the analysis pieces, uh, using uh, emerging standard within uh, from the data mining group 
uh, which is called uh, the Predictive Modeling Markup Language. Uh, this, uh, this PMML format is widely supported in majority of uh, um, the data uh, mining components and uh, software is available in the market. So uh, we thought that would uh, uh, be something uh, we, can, we can use uh, in terms of sharing the models uh, across platforms and making it extensible and scalable that way. Uh, uh, coming to the OEAI early alert pipeline itself, uh, at the core, uh, we, what we are using is Pentaho Business Intelligence Suite. Uh, in, in particular, we are using two pieces. Uh, one is the Pentaho Kettle, uh, which majorly deals with uh, staging the data, uh, extracting the data, transforming, and uh, loading the data uh, into uh, the next piece, which is going to be our data mining models. So uh, for the data integration purposes, we use Kettle. And uh, the outputs of the kettle is fed into uh, the data mining and predictive uh, uh, modeling framework, which is uh, the Pentaho Waker uh, uh, component, uh, which we are using to build the models. In the next slide, uh, we can see a high-level workflow uh, of uh, what's actually going on uh, in this particular learning analytics processor. Right. So uh, in particular, there are like two applications we develop. One is a Sakai admin tool because we wanted to extract uh, data from, uh, uh, from Sakai, the uh, usage data uh, in terms of uh, uh, how the students are accessing and uh, you know, how the courses are being taught, what is the activity in that particular course, uh, those kind of data, and also what the students have been uh, scoring in each of the gradable criteria that the instructor has set. So uh, uh, we came up with uh, like a web application tool uh, which basically feeds, into, uh, feeds the data into our uh, learning analytics processor, uh, which, uh, um, uh, which, which is more uh, uh, doing the heavy lifting in terms of the uh, analysis and rolling out the uh, results in terms of risk assessments of the students. So uh, the, the first step, of when, as soon as you uh, start this particular process, uh, what happens is it goes and communicates with the Sakai admin tool, grabs two uh, relevant files, which is the activity uh, CSV and grade CSV. Uh, on top of it, it also pulls uh, data from the student information system. Uh, at Myros, we use something called a banner system. So basically, we pull the demographic data of the student uh, also from uh, and feed it into our models. Uh, along with this, we also take uh, uh, the current workload of the student, the enrollments uh, that has happened over the semester uh, as well, and feed that one, uh, that kind of data as well into the learning analytics processor. Within the learning analytics processor, uh, the, uh, once we have the relevant data and we have checked for uh, the veracity of the input files that are coming in, uh, then uh, uh, we feed this data into a kettle-based pipeline uh, so that we can stage the data and feed the data into the OAAI PMML model, uh, which is the early alert model. Uh, in this case, we are using logistic regression-based models to make our predictions. Uh, uh, so all, the, all of these models were developed using Pentaho Waker by uh, considering uh, historical data at Marist for worth of uh, two to three semesters. And uh, using that, we tried to uh, find, uh, we tried to identify trends and patterns as to what, con uh, what attributes to student success or student failure and uh, how we can use uh, to uh, you know, use that analysis to actually make quality predictions in terms of uh, risk assessments on the ongoing semester. So uh, once uh, uh, the predictions are made, we, uh, the next stage is to output these results using a RESTful API. Uh, in, uh, at, at the, uh, as a first stage, uh, what we have done is we have kept the reports really simple. What it's going to have is like the student ID, uh, the course he or she is enrolled in, and uh, the risk category uh, that the student uh, is classified under by the model. 
Uh, for most part, the model is a probabilistic model. Uh, we take a step further and discretize uh, the probabilities, the uh, success or failure probabilities that we receive uh, and categorize into three uh, risk categories, uh, the high risk category, medium risk category, uh, low risk, and, uh, the, uh, and also the no risk category. So uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the features uh, that are present in this particular architecture in the next slide. So, uh, so in, in this particular architecture, we have uh, input source management. Uh, like I said, we need to make sure that the data coming in uh, is, uh, um, is adhering the format uh, as dictated by the uh, LAP architecture. Uh, so uh, before uh, we uh, run any kind of further analysis, right? So uh, that is like a key piece uh, in this particular architecture. The next is we are using a temporary storage as well as a persistent storage. Uh, for most part in, uh, within the kettle flows itself, uh, some of the analysis um, are done majorly using temporary tables and everything. Uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the very end, when you're rolling out the outputs and everything, uh, you won't be requiring a larger piece of analysis that has happened using these flows. So it, it didn't make sense to retain all of this uh, into, and write it into a persistent storage. So what we did is at the end of the analysis, we just uh, destroy all of this uh, data and retain what is actually necessary and actually important. Uh, then we also have like a configuration manager. Uh, it basically um, manages and sequences what kind of flows need to run in this particular pipeline, what kind of models we are using, provides all the metadata related to all of these uh, uh, intricate details, uh, and also uh, stages um, of what the pipeline is about and uh, what needs to happen. Then comes the actual pipeline processor itself, where uh, you're executing each of these flows uh, using uh, the sequence that is provided in the configuration manager. Uh, once that is done, uh, we uh, later roll out the results. There is like a, a notification handler, as well as uh, a RESTful API, uh, which uh, feeds into various other systems uh, that can leverage the analysis. Uh, that is coming out of this particular technology. Uh, one of the key features I, um, I would like to point out is the extensibility, right? Uh, in this particular architecture, uh, like I said, when we were uh, trying to come up with this, uh, we envisioned to, uh, to have like the App Store model and realize it as much as possible and uh, not stick to one particular analysis and limit it to one particular platform. So uh, the, uh, this particular ar architecture, it can have like multiple pipelines as well as uh, it also supports uh, varied pipeline platforms. For example, uh, at Maris we are using a uh, kettle-based pipeline in order to run our analysis, uh, in, in order to run our models and everything. But at, at a later date, if we have a better working model, uh, probably we just developed in R or any other setting, then uh, that should not uh, hamper uh, uh, us from using that particular uh, insights we are getting from a, a model, uh, from a different model, right? So we have provided hooks within this particular architecture where we can support varied pipelines. Uh, in the next slide, uh, you're going to see a uh, very high-level architecture. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to dive into a lot of detail. Uh, it's basically what I explained uh, in, in terms of the features of the LAP architecture. If you have more targeted questions, uh, we can address those uh, in the Q&A section. Now, what I would like to bring out in this particular uh, architecture is we have broken down the analysis pieces into uh, uh, the data mining uh, and analysis pieces into three major components. One is the preprocessor component, the model processor component, and the next one is the post processor. 
So in the preprocessor, what happens is we stage the data, um, uh, go in with our hammers and make sure that we mold the data uh, so that it's more conducive to perform uh, robust analytics uh, using various data mining algorithms. Uh, the model processor is where um, you feed this data and gain quality predictions leveraging the models you have developed, uh, you, in this case using uh, Kettle and Waker. Uh, and then comes the post-processor phase, where, uh, which, which deals uh, a lot more in terms of output handling, uh, sending right notifications to uh, the uh, concerned folks, etc. Uh, in order to manage all of this, we have like a pipeline manager, which basically uh, contains the sequence of execution. For example, uh, uh, in one particular analysis, I might need uh, to run uh, multiple iterations of preprocessor and model processor. So what I can do is just go ahead and sequence it in the pipeline manager. So um, when it is scheduled, it basically uh, runs as expected and uh, performs all the analysis required. Uh, with that, I'm going to forward uh, yeah, the pattern to Bob so that he can go ahead and uh, demo all of these uh, features for you. Over to you, okay. Bob. Yep. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to uh, do a quick demo of the technologies that we've developed so far. I'll give you a little demo of those. Um, uh, if you reference back to the high-level workflow here, um, we have the Sakai admin tool, which I'll show you first. Um, which produces two CSVs, activities, and grades. And then the learning analytics processor, the second part, which does the processing. And then the third part, the RESTful API, we created a kind of a model dashboard, um, just a very basic dashboard to, to show you um, what kind of data comes out of that and kind of uh, give you a visualization of that. So with that, Okay, so with this, um, th this is a very uh, basic uh, Sakai tool, Sakai integrated tool. And when that, it goes out and uh, can create those CSV files that we talked about um, for data to put into the Learn Analytics pr um, processor. Um, the, the parts here um, just uh, let you know the last date of the extraction. Um, and then if you have any scheduled um, dates, um, you can go in and schedule dates and times that you would, uh, dates and times that you would like to uh, to have an automated uh, extraction of the activity and grades data, if you so uh, choose. Um, and here, um, you can select an extra extraction date. Um, it tells you the date and time it was extracted and whether or not it was a manual or a scheduled extraction. Um, you may uh, also click on these two here to actually download either uh, activity CSVs or grade CSVs. Um, the second section, um, you can extract a new set of data. So if you want to run a manual extraction, uh, you can filter you can filter your uh, your extractions by site, so site title. So say if you have terms in your uh, Sakai sites, uh, say like summer 2014 or fall 2014, whatnot, you you can uh, you can do that, or you can put an entire site title if you only want to get one site site's information. Um, the second part, um, for activity date ranges, so that way uh, if you don't enter any dates, you get all of the, uh, all of the activity dates for that particular site or sites, per se. If you want to only limit the, uh, the date ranges uh, for activities, you can uh, enter a start date or an end date simply by clicking that. And then once you have all the data that you'd like, you, you can just click Extract Data, and it will uh, go in to the Sky system and extract all of the, the gradebook data and the activity data. Now those CSVs can be transferred over to the uh, learning processor, which you'll see on my screen now. Um, it's a very basic at this point um, interface. Uh, essentially, uh, once you have those, you put those CSVs into a certain uh, directory at this point, and then you would just click the, uh, the run button, and the run will, uh, will run and produce um, I'll just show you really quickly that you can see that it actually uh, processed, finished all the job entries, assignments, and things like that. And of course, you can't see. Sorry. There. Um, pipeline. Uh, you can see here. 
pipeline complete. So, so it's been completed. And then if we go back into Sakai, um, go back into the course here. Uh, this is a, a very basic LTI tool, <laughs> basic LTI uh, tool that uh, that sends a, a, rest, a request to the REST API from the Learn Analytics processor that uh, sends the data back here. So we can actually click on some of these. These little each each of these circles represents either a, a green, a no risk, a yellow, a low risk, or a red, a high risk student. So you'll notice if I click on click on one, for instance, this one, student one, um, in our course is a uh, is a no risk. Um, I can click on student 13, who's a uh, low risk, and then like a student 20, which is a high risk. So this is just a very basic uh, demonstration of the LTI integration, which sends a call to the REST API, the Learning Analytics Processor. So that's, uh, that's the work that we've uh, accomplished so far. <clears throat> Bob, if I could just jump in, there was one thing I meant to mention earlier on the strategy slide that I'll just bring out here, which is that although the work that uh, we're doing at the moment, and obviously what you've demoed is uh, being developed with Sakai in mind, uh, we are very much architecting things so that uh, to make it as easy as possible to deploy this in other learning management systems. And there's a couple of, for example, Moodle schools that I know of that are looking at adopting uh, some of the work we're doing. So I, I, I think we're moving in the Aperio community to make sure that this is something that can be kind of LMS agnostic. Obviously, some LMSs will be uh, more open or, than others, and that makes it easier to implement. But I just wanted to mention that. Yes, we're, we're, we are actually, yeah, yeah. We're, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for, uh, for using, users of uh, other schools to use other LMSs and things like that. So. All right. <laughs> you want to go on to the next slide, and I think we can wrap up. Oh, yep. So I, I just thought I would end uh, my comments here with a kind of personal invitation to everybody on the phone, and please share this with others. Uh, the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference, or WAC Conference, which you may be familiar with, is really the premier international conference for uh, researchers in the field of learning analytics. The fifth annual conference will be held in uh, the week of March 16th here at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. We are this year introducing something new, which is a practitioner track. So we're going to uh, allow for and, and support some presentations outside of pure research. Um, and so if you're interested, we've just last few weeks uh, announced the call for presentation proposals for that. So the website down there is where you can go to, uh, to get more information. Kate, do you want to wrap Great. up? Yeah, so thank you, Josh. Uh, just another opportunity to connect. This one happening actually next week. For anybody who may be attending the EDUCAUSE conference that's happening in Orlando, um, Unicon does have a booth, so I've listed our numbers here, 702 and 704. Uh, Josh is going to be kind enough to stop by during a couple of the, the busier breaks that happen on Tuesday and be in the booth with us. So if you're interested in continuing the conversation around uh, open learning analytics, if you're interested in talking more about the work that, that Maris has done or the work that, that Unicon has uh, partnered in, in the development of with Maris on these tools, please do stop by. We'd love to chat with you. And uh, we're going to go ahead and open it up, uh, open up the, the line so that folks can ask questions if they have them. We do have a question that's come in from, from Wisconsin uh, on the chat. If you don't have uh, the phone audio and want to jump in on the chat, please do. Uh, just a final invitation here to join us in the Aperio Learning Analytics Initiative community. Uh, we are a very inclusive community of folks who are interested in pursuing, uh, accelerating the work around open learning analytics. Um, I've listed here the uh, email alias for the, the coordinator of uh, kind of the analytics community if you are interested in joining or learning more. Um, I did also intend to, to add a URL here for 
the, the Confluence space that keeps a lot of the information about the work that's happening in LAI. Um, I'll make sure that that gets distributed when we send out the slides to folks um, after the fact. But we'd love to have you join us. We have uh, hangouts every two weeks um, during this time slot, actually, to just uh, kind of get together and talk about things that are happening and try to push things forward in that community. So we'd love to have anybody to join us if who's interested. Uh, that being said, I'm going to start with the question from Wisconsin, uh, which is, do you need to have the historical data for the courses that you wish to run the predictive model on? So Sandeep or Josh, you want to pick this one up? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll answer that one. And if there's more specific technical questions, Sandeep can jump in. Um, I will also uh, note that our analytics coordinator, Alan Berg, is here on the phone conference or the web webinar. So. Uh, I'm sure Alan can jump in uh, with, with comments if that's useful. Uh, yeah, so in terms of historical data, um, I guess the answer is a little bit of a yes or no. Um, you certainly can use the predictive model as it is today. It's uh, available under an open license uh, without having to tune it, or you don't need, you know, if you didn't have historical data, you wouldn't be tuning that model. Um, and as you saw, we get reasonably good accuracy rates uh, without tuning, so you could have that model in place and, and have it perform reasonably well, like, you know, or I would guess it would perform reasonably well. One of the things that we have worked with some institutions on is what we call a data model val validation report. And so either on your own or, or in collaboration with us, we can take data, let's say from your last semester, a sample a couple of courses or a larger set of data, run it through our model and then analyze how accurate it was um, and then give that back to you so you have a sense of, okay, if we use the model out of the box without tuning, how accurate would it be um, and, and that kind of thing. I should say that accuracy is only one of several important measures to be looking at, things like how many false positives are created and other, other more kind of complex analysis is important to do when you're looking at how valid a model might be for your particular institution. The last thing I'll say here is that I do encounter a lot of kind of confusion in the analytics world around the difference between what I might call reporting and predictive analytics. So ultimately, if you want a real predictive analytics model, you need to have historical data to base that model on. Now again, I think what we've done in OAI gets people a little bit of way of leapfrogging because we have a model we've produced from our data. Uh, but, uh, but again, I think that tuning process is kind of important. Great. Thank you, Josh. Um, and, and Alan jumped in, and I'll come back to the, the question from Christopher Berry. Alan jumped in with a, have you got an example report to share? Um, Josh, can you kind of talk to what documents you have that you can share? Um, I, I, we, we've done work with uh, a couple of different institutions. Uh, probably the largest was the South Orange Community College District. Um, and I think we just need to check in with them to make sure they're comfortable with sharing those reports. But um, maybe if anybody's interested, they could email us separately and then we can follow up on, on what we can share there. Great. Thank you. The, the second question you have is uh, the standard calculation for determining the accuracy of the model. How, do you, how are you measuring that your model is 75% uh, accurate, for instance? Right. Uh, when we are developing the models, right, so we're basically working with the historical data, so we know that what the students have scored in their particular courses, uh, so that gives us a frame of reference as to, you know, what the model predicts. Uh, that can be compared against the actuals. And uh, we keep a track of metrics like accuracy, false positive rate, precision, and recall, uh, which, uh, um, uh, which, which is really important in deducing uh, the uh, potency of the model. Uh, and using these factors, uh, we uh, arrive at a conclusion as to what the accuracy ranges are, uh, whether it is a reasonably good model or uh, we can't use it at all. So this kind of analysis is done by keeping track of these metrics. I'll mention too briefly that when we develop the models, 
best practice is always to split the original data set into uh, two. So one data set is used to create the models. The other data set is then used to test the models. So that's another way early on to look for accuracy. Right. And obviously we had control groups. So that was important too because uh, once you begin to deploy interventions to the population, it obviously changes the, the outcome. And so uh, the, the control groups allowed us to look at accuracy without the influence of intervention. So. And we have a contribution about uh, tenfold cross-validation. I don't know if, <laughs> Sandeep, you want to mention anything about that. Uh, well, uh, yeah, we, we did use uh, various uh, uh, cross-validation techniques as well. Uh, but majorly what we did is uh, we reserved two semesters worth of data, which we used as training data set, and uh, one semester worth of data completely for testing purposes, uh, where we scored uh, um, using the trained models, uh, a whole slew of models actually, uh, and uh, compared the results and uh, uh, built a model library uh, where we have like good uh, working models. Yep. Great. The conference is now in conversation mode. Other questions from folks on the phone? And any other questions in chat? Doesn't look like it. All right. Uh, well, you have some contact information here. Um, hopefully this has been useful to provide at least a, a high-level view of things going on in, in, with OAI and, and moving that forward from a technology perspective. We'd love to talk further. If there are questions that come up after the fact, please feel free to reach out to the folks that have presented today. Um, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll send out a recording. We'll send out these slides as well. Feel free to, to send those to other colleagues who may be interested. And hope to see you at the LAC conference in March, and, and hope to see uh, any of you who may be at EDUCAUSE next week. Thanks so much for your time, everyone.